Um, thank you all. Thank you all for having me here, and thank you for the introduction. Um, welcome to this talk, Doing for Sustainability What Open Source Did for Software. Um, as introduced, my name is Asim Hussain. I am the Executive Director of the Green Software Foundation. Um, we are a consortium of, I think, 62 organizations now, and our mission is, uh, our vision is a future where software has zero harmful environmental effects. Um, we do open source, but we're primarily a standards and policy organization. We do standards around green software. Um, and there you can find me. These are places you can find me. Usually LinkedIn. I, 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 not really, you can, good luck trying to get on me, get me on Twitter these days. Not for any other reason, just because I don't have time. Um, and welcome to this talk. Probably a bit of a different talk than what you, you, you might be expecting. Um, I'm going to talk about power. I don't mean electricity. I actually think a lot about electricity, but I'm talking about power, the asymmetry of power. Um, I'm going to talk about measurement, one of my, my favorite topics. I've, I'm deep, deep, deep into measurement these days. I'm going to talk, try and get you interested in it, talk about the history of measurement. I'm going to talk about a tool or framework we've been building in the uh, Green Software Foundation called, called the Impact Framework. Um, and then there'll be time for Q&A afterwards. The reason the talk's like this is the Impact Framework is a command line tool that takes a YAML file and turns it into a slightly different YAML file. And when I've given these talks before, it's a really, you know, it's a really, really boring talk. It's just like, ah. um, there's me on the stage really excited and everybody's like, what's going on? Um, but yes, yeah, so I'm going to try and talk a little bit about the history and give you a big framing of, of kind of what it is. Because Impact Framework is a very different type of tool. People try and bucket into things, but it's, it's, we're a standards organization. That's, we're, we're building tooling to help standards. Um, uh, what's this? A raised hand? Anything else? Everybody's nervous. You'll know it's a trick question, right? Yes, no, it's not a raised hand. This is actually a qubit. It's the distance between your elbow and the tip of your finger is a qubit. So it's a, it's a, a, a distance measure, an ancient Egyptian distance measure. Very convenient, right? You're not going to lose that. It's always, well, you might lose it. But it's always like there. How many times have you measured something like this? And the uh, Ethiopia, Ethiopians have a saying, which is uh, send your friend with long arms to the market. <laughs> right? I love that. I've got, I've, got, I've got loads of these. As I said, I'm deep into measurement these days. Um, but right now, I'm going to talk about power. What is power? Um, I define power as the ability. Well, I don't define it. This is a definition that I particularly like. Power is the ability to influence people and events. That's what I think of as power. That is a good definition of power. This is a powerful conference because there's a lot of influencing of people and events happening here. Um, but power isn't good or bad, right? What you do with power can be good for some and bad for others. And uh, although we really enjoy the process of labeling things and like labeling people, oh, they're powerful or they're powerless, right? Forget about the states. We're all of us in this room are more powerful than the people um, scrabbling around in the ground in clouds of mercury to get the lithium to power our batteries. Right? Power isn't, forget about the state, think about the vectors of force. I think about, um, there's two forces here. They're the forces that work to concentrate power in as few hands as possible. And there are forces that work to dilute power into as many hands as possible. So when I think about which side I'm on, I'm on the power, I'm on the side of the Dilution power. Like that's what I focus in on. One of the things I'm really proud of in the, the Green Software Foundation is we run through consensus. And we have a lot of rules. So we have one of our rules is that each organization gets one vote. It doesn't matter if you're a behemoth with half a billion employees or you're a nonprofit with 10. You both get one vote. We both have the same amount of power and influence. Um, what are some ideas that have worked to dilute power? I think a, a great idea is democracy, right? There was a time before democracy. 
some person woke up one day and said, oh, Gary, I've got an idea. I think we'll call it voting, right? So somebody had the idea of democracy, right? It was something that, that diluted power. What are, what are other technologies that have diluted power? Like I think internet. You know, knowledge is power. Like through the internet, that knowledge has been given to everybody. It's diluted power, right? Uh, blockchain gets a, gets a bad rap in the sustainability space. But fundamentally, it's a technology designed to dilute power. This is the spectrum with which I, I look through life. I don't, people try and label me as left and right. If you want, you can try and label me as center, but you'll be very confused. I look at the life through the spectrum of power. Okay, that's, I'm, I'm, we're a very small organization and we need to influence unbelievable things, right? So I think a lot about the asymmetry of power and what, what, what levers can you use to, to shift things. Um, open source has been a real inspiration. Open source I describe as a dilution of power. If you remember the world before open source, closed source, proprietary, was all about the concentration of power into as few hands as possible. Open source is the unbelievable dilution of power. I've, I've worked in a lot of enterprise organizations over my career. I won't say all the time, but a few occasions, a few occasions come to mind where, you know, an executive, somebody typically who's not in the tech, tech space, has gotten really annoyed at some open source project. It's really like, you know, it's really breaking my jam here. You know, I've got something, and there's this open source project doing something that's affecting it, right? Can you go do something about it? I'm like, what, what are you going to do? What, what, you, what you would do? Oh, just, you know, get the lawyers involved. What, even if you were to shut it down somehow, someone's just going to fork it and do something else. Like, open source is this beautiful dilution of power. Um... And when I think of sustainability, fundamentally, when I think of sustainability, I think it's the fight against the concentration of power. This space is extremely complicated. Right? There's so many things going on. And it can be very challenging to understand, kind of, well, well is that good? You know, sometimes the people think, oh, this is sustainable. I'm like, wait a second, what are you doing? So the way I think about it is, you know, what is... What is the problem that we're solving other than the fact that some powerful actors are deciding they can harm the world with impunity? Why? Because we can. We can get away with it. Right? That's basically what I think of uh, when it comes to sustainability. So how do we dilute power? Right? And the message I want to get across, and I'm trying to get across these days, is that we have a power in our hands that you wouldn't believe, right? a capability to change the world, to massively dilute power, and it's, and it's so simple. <clears throat> it's in my speaker notes, so I've got to do it. Um, what's this? Woof! Woof! A dog bark? Yes, it's also a peninculma. A peninculma is an old Finnish unit of length. And it was the uh, distance with which you could hear a dog bark. <laughs> right? It's kind of standardized somewhat to six kilometers. But it was, um, you might think to yourself first off, that's a really dumb unit of length. Because it depends, right? If you're in a wide open space, that you're going to hear it a long distance. If you're in a thick wooded forest, it's going to be shorter. But that was the point, because it gave you other information. It, it told you stuff about your terrain. I mean, uh, we think, oh, you know, that's not what we do these days. But my, my, my flight over was two podcasts long, <laughs> right? I don't know how many miles, it's two podcasts long. Two, um, uh, didn't we listen to Duncan Trussell Family Hour? Sometimes, yeah? Psychedelic brother. Um, so yeah, so uh, Duncan, two Duncan Trussell family hours over. Um, I mean, measurement. 
I'm deep into this. This is going to get violent. Um, so this is a is that that the image on the right hand side. That's a maquito. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. That's how you say it, a maquito. Um, this was the the Aztec, you know, closed quarter combat weapon of choice. And there's basically just a club with a obsidian jammed into the edges. If you know what obsidian is like, it's like a volcanic glass. That if you were to chip just the right way, it creates an edge that is sharper than a steel razor blade. Yeah. Um, the Aztecs, oh, nasty. Um, they basically just pissed off a lot of people by doing some very, I can't even, by doing some very nasty things. And they got all pushed to an island in South, uh, uh, South America. An island which they couldn't grow any crops on it, and there weren't enough stuff to, you know, to hunt and gather. So they decided to become a trading port. So the Aztec Empire was actually a trading empire. That's kind of what, 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 what they grew. Um, and what they said, they tried, they tried to become the Switzerland of the region. They said, come here. We guarantee your safety. You can trade. There's no problem at all. You'll trade. We'll, we'll make sure no one's going to cheat you. And so um, what you could do is if you went there, you'd leave your weapons at the port. If you went there and you, know, you were trading with somebody um, and you felt they were cheating you, right? they were using a weight which wasn't quite accurate, you could call over the police, which were basically just uh, local Aztec warrior thugs with their little maquitals. And uh, they had standardized weights on them. All of them had standardized weights on them. Right? And they would come and they would check to see if the, uh, if the trader was using wrong weights. Right? And if they, if they were caught cheating, there were no prisons here. If you look at the Aztec you know, system, pretty much everything was death. Pretty much everything was death. Right? And so it was just like... Right? I don't know if you would chop the head off, but you know, you're, not, you're not recovering from that. Um, the really cool thing about this, I think it's really cool, um, <laughs> was that um, if you called them over and the weights were the same, so they weren't cheating, you died. Oh. Right? So if you're calling the police, someone's dying. Right? Someone's dying. Not quite sure how this relates to the talk. But um, I really like that story. Um, I've got loads of these stories about, about historical use of measurement, you know, life and death. This is life and death. Right? It's been used as a tool of power. Um, my French isn't that great, but I believe that's pronounced Cahier de Dolence. Cahier de Dolence. So um, this is, and I can't remember which king was it King Louis the seventh, eighth, ninth? I can't remember. Um, just before the French Revolution, he was like, "Oh, you all seem to be quite pissed off with me. Why don't you all write it all down, and I'll air your grievances?" And so he asked the three estates of France just to write down all their grievances. So the three estates were the the clergy, the nobility, and everyone else, the peasants, right? And pretty much, you know, the peasants were all complaining that. The, um, they demanded that their lords be stripped of authority over weights and measures because this was a common way of screwing over people. It was like, oh, you know, no, no, that's not that many weight measures of corn. That's this many weight measures of corn. I'm only going to pay you this much. It was a common way of, of theft, essentially. Um, I don't think it's had the reaction that he wanted and it kind of half-triggered the actual French Revolution, another example of chopping off of heads. Um, but it also, interestingly, was one of the drivers of the metric system. So the metric system was described as, was built as a measure as this, uh, by the people for the people. That's what it was built on. Like the measure of distance was decided to be a, a fraction of the circumference of the Earth. So you actually then had to go and figure out what the circumference of the Earth was. And uh, a kilo was uh, measured by uh, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters volume of water. That way, a kilo was then linked to distance, and therefore it's got nothing to do with the length of your king's foot anymore, right? 
Um, so it kind of triggered, like their measurement again is being used as a tool to take power away from the powerful, to dilute power. There's a whole story here about, you know, why do we have, I don't have time for it, I wish I did, about why don't we have 100 seconds in, in a minute. And for about 10 years in France, they did. There was uh, uh, the, the Republic calendar. There's a whole other story there as well. Um, just another example of power and measurement. Does anybody here like measure their carbon footprint at all? Like one or two, three? Those hands are going to slowly come down now for a second. Do you know what? Do you know where the term carbon footprint comes from? Any idea? This is going to really upset you. All of you. In 2004, BP hired the firm, uh, the PR public relation firm Ogilvy and Maher, because they said we seem people seem to be quite upset with us because we are. They're, cl they're claiming that we're causing global emissions and, and, and global warming. So they created a tool called a carbon footprint calculator. Right? Because now, then they said, oh, we've got this terrible problem of climate warming. Why don't you measure your carbon footprint? Right? It's really bad that we've got this problem because of your carbon footprint. Right? Why don't you reduce your carbon footprint or we are going to be in trouble? Okay. I love this. I absolutely love this. I, so, I meditate. I, sometimes I sit and I, and I literally meditate on this chess move. This is a genius move. You know, absolutely genius. It's taken the problem away from them and onto you. Onto you and, it, and it flipped the script completely. Completely flipped the script. So 20 years later, well, I, I measure and offset my carbon off footprint as well, right? But we all do it. What can we learn from this? This is an unbelievable, just slight change in how you think about measurement, which completely shifted how the world works, right? Measurement is how we can um, change the world. I've got so many more of these, but I don't have time. So I'm going to skip forward to this. So measurement is a tool for power. It's our tool for power. It's how we, we can change the world and it's how we can fix sustainability as far as I'm concerned. Um, right. I'm hopefully I'm going to be able to join the dots here because it's, uh, it's, it's a challenge. Um, oh, I've got another one. Uh, which one should I do? Does anybody know what a collop is? A collop. You wouldn't know. This is actually, I believe it's Irish, uh, old Irish or Celtic, I don't know. It's a, it's a measure, it's the amount of land you need to graze a cow. Right? And it changes. Because, you know, if you've got very fertile land, you need a smaller area. If you've got very you know, arid land, you need a larger area. But if you think if you're a farmer, you don't care how many acres you care how many collops you've got because you, you've got like 20 cows, you need 20 collops. But it's hard to tax people on collops, right? You've got to tax people on acres, you've got to put it there. Measurement is a tool of, of power. So um, I've got a video here, which I'm not too sure, I don't think the audio is going to come out. Um, we, we tried to make, this isn't a commercial product, but it might look like a commercial video. We tried to make a video to help people ex to explain impact framework, because it is a little bit different. But hopefully, I'm going to try and talk through it. Is that playing? Ah. So the impact framework is this tool that we've built. Oh, no, it's written there. Uh, accurately. It takes observations you can easily gather about running systems such as CPU utilization, page views, and number of installs, and converts them into environmental impacts like carbon, water, and energy, and anything else, really. In a transparent, replicable, auditable, and verifiable way. Working with Impact Framework is like working with a set of building blocks we call plugins. Plugins work together in a pipeline, each doing its part in converting observations into impacts. The plugin ecosystem is growing fast. 
you choose the plugins that calculate the specific environmental impact you're interested in. You can use plugins from the ecosystem or develop your own. Simply add them to your pipeline with impact framework, the possibilities are as expansive as the ecosystem it thrives in. The magic happens in a manifest file, a comprehensive record housing your observations, plugins, configurations, assumptions, and computed environmental impacts. Transparency becomes the norm as you open up your manifest file. Using impact framework is like sharing the entire recipe instead of just the finished dish. We believe in verify, don't trust. Others can rerun your manifest file, verify your findings, and even challenge your assumptions. When you use impact framework, you are taking a step towards decentralizing impact measurement and democratizing data. Something big is happening here. We're liberating measurement. With impact framework, if you can observe something, you can measure its impact. What observations can you make by the software you want to measure? Anyway, I'm just reading that out because normally the, the sound will come through. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm just going to skip through some slides. I, was, I had some slides just in case that didn't work. Yeah, so I showed you there something. Um, we, met, we briefly touched on this thing called a manifest file. Impact framework doesn't do it. Just it takes a YAML file and it generates another YAML file. It's this, it's this manifest file, right? That's all it is. So we, it's not a configuration file. It's a transparent, executable record of environmental impacts, right? And it can be quite large. You've got one organization that's computing it for their entire infrastructure, and it's about 13 megabytes, oh, 48 megabytes. So they can be quite large files, you know, tens and tens and tens of thousands of servers, all, all, all sorts of things. But just to dive into a specific component of this, just so you understand it a little bit more. In a, in a manifest file, we have this thing called a tree. And a tree has what, what are the things you're measuring. We describe it as a component. One of the things we've built in the foundation is called something called a software carbon intensity specification, which has just gone into ISO. And so a lot of this is being built to actually help people calculate your software carbon intensity score of your applications. And in the, in the SCI specification, it talks about software components. A software component is something that can emit environmental impacts. So that's a component. So you can have as many as you want in a tree structure. Um, what we describe it is, is observations. You can take observations about things that you own, some software components. An observation is a time series of things, things you can, you can observe. Uh, for a server, I'm going to break out one of these. Um, oh, and one of those things we call an observation parameter. And I've, I've broken this out. So for this server, I just can observe a couple of things. I know it's utilization. I know it's, it's vendor. I know the region. I know the instance type. But just, this is just what I know, right? What I can gather about the things I'm, I'm running. I want to be able to take that information and compute an environmental impact. So we do that with, with what we call model plugins. So there's one model plugin here, which we call cloud metadata. So you can add a plugin to your pipeline. As I said, it's a YAML file, right? You want the Aztec story again, don't you? But um, uh, it's a plugin. And so what, we, what we're trying to do is I'm trying to get, I've got utilization and want to compute carbon or water or something else, right? So how do I do that? We've got one plugin called Cloud Metadata. And just to so show you how it works, all that happens is you take those parameters, you pass it in, and whatever it returns back out, you append it to the, to the manifest file. So now I've got a little bit more information because cloud metadata has given it to me. Like, what is this standard E64 v3? Give me some information about that. But that's not enough. I want energy. So what can I do? Well, we've got, there's a plugin called Teed's Curve, which, given something called a TDP of a chip and a utilization, will give you energy. Right? So now we've got energy. But I want more. I need carbon. Well, I need to know how clean and dirty that electricity was. So I'll use a plugin from a, 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 this is a non-profit called What Time, and if you give them a timestamp and a geolocation, they'll tell you how clean or dirty that electricity is. And this is 369 grams of carbon per kilowatt hour. Now I've got energy in that. I can just multiply them together, and I use another plugin for that operational carbon, and I've got carbon. All of that is getting stored and recorded in this manifest file. 
right? All that's getting stored and recorded in this manifest file. Um, it's not a configuration file. It's a transparent record. You need to compute your impacts, but then you need to share them with other people. You're not going to share them that summary number. You're going to share them this entire manifest file. You're going to be fully transparent about all of your emissions, everything that drove it. Because I'm tired of just being, some, someone tells me these are my emissions, and I'm like, well, I don't know how you calculated that. I don't know the assumptions that you made. I don't know if that's comparable with anybody else. You need to be fully transparent. Um, what we want people to do is like, this is, this is my emissions. This is my manifest file. I'm going to push it to, to GitHub and GitLab and everything. that I, I've, This is how much I've emitted. And someone goes, I don't agree with you. I'm going to fork it. I'm going to put my models, my assumptions, my coefficients. I'm going to recalculate it. And I'm going to tell you this is actually what I think your, your emissions are. I have a saying, uh, make diff, not war, right? I want people you know, to stop, stop having, stop shouting and screaming at each other and being angry on Twitter. Just, what is your impact? Diff it. OK, I disagree with you. This is how I disagree with you. This is why I think a lot of the people in our space, they, 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 we're a consensus-based organization, so there's a lot of arguments, right? But there are arguments between two people with great viewpoints, and they're both great ideas, and they're both great ways of looking at the problem. So make diff, not war. Um, and I have a, also another saying. Like I say, if you're fully transparent, you can never be accused of greenwashing. You can only be accused of being wrong, right? That's it. You can only be accused of being wrong. Um, I don't know how long I've been. Oh, I've not got time. Um, the other thing, so the, the thing that we're doing with that manifest file, as I said, we're a standards body. Um, so forget about the tooling. We are working to get this thing standardized as an ISO standard. So if you want to report your environmental impacts of your software or anything, what's your manifest file? You want to make a claim of greenness? What's your manifest file? Like, be, be that standard. I used to think that, that now, now I know that standards is, is a really powerful tool to change the world. Um, other thing we standardize is that, is that those plugins are just, it's, it's, this is it. If you've got some library or something which, which measures something or computes something, to expose it and make it pluggable into this ecosystem, you just have to add a pretty standardized interface. It's all in, JavaScript right now, but there's other bindings as well. Um, what was I going to say about this? Can't remember. Um, we ran a hackathon recently around Impact Framework, and we got a whole bunch of there's a 50, 60 solutions were built. I'll just highlight a few of them there. The the one, the top one, I I loved. Uh, didn't win, but I loved it. Uh, Grasp, and it was a plugin that you could add to your pipeline which then computed different impacts, different, we had a beyond carbon category, and it computed death. Right? How many people are going to die because of your software? Right? Computed death. We, people avoid that, but that's what this is all about, right? It's computed death. Also computed displacement. If you don't know something, one of the aspects of climate change is what's going to happen before all of that is that massive amounts of displacement of people you know, inside countries, people are going to have to shift. There are going to be lots of refugees kind of going on your doorstep and just sorting out what is, how many people are going to be displaced. There's something called a social cost of carbon, which is what is the, you know, it's not, what is the cost of carbon as you bring it down the, the ages and to your children, your children, what is the literal dollar cost of it? Um, some people wrote water impact. What is the impact of water? Water stress is an increasing issue for data centers and, and the like. Uh, we had a, an under-18s prize, which I loved. It's the first time we've done an under-18s prize. And the team that won it ran a, ran an, a built uh, an emissions estimator with Zoom. They were, they were uh, when we gave them, we, we had to try to give the prize online. And uh, uh, they couldn't, they couldn't, because they had to be in class. So they were in class, we couldn't give them the prize. They had to, oh, we, we were just like one minute too late. They had to run to class. Um, but a whole bunch of other types of plugins been built, you know, linking it to Kubernetes, Prometheus, Azure, GCP, just a whole load of them have been built. 
Um, and we built, we're, it's going to be released soon. There's an explorer, so a place you can find the different plugins. Um, something that's just starting, the conversation's just starting right now, is I'm calling it Sci-Fi Day, and no one's told me that I can't call it that now. Um, but because we've got SI, Software Carbon Intensity, and I've always wanted to call something Sci-Fi, but now this Impact Framework, IF, FI, I thought it was close enough. So uh, Sci-Fi Day. So we've now got the technology to actually, um, uh, there's community members building like a CI CD pipeline so you can actually compute. One of the things we, with software carbon intensity specification we built was we wanted to build a specification where you could measure the impacts of open source software very specifically. So now we've got that, it's an ISO standard. Um, our goal is, is a day every year where we can celebrate you know, all the open source projects leading the world by computing their SDI score um, proving it transparently by adding one of those manifest files in your root of your repo. Um, one of my things is I think open source is going gonna, is gonna to lead the world because really what we want is, is the proprietary and closed source and SaaS products. We want them to be releasing this information as well. But we think what's going to happen is if we can get the open source ecosystem to do it first, it's going to force the other uh, enterprises to do it. Like one of the, some, of the, some of the regulations coming down the pipeline um, in this space, like the CS Triple D and, and other things from the EU, you are going to have to provide evidence that you are actually doing something. And one of the things we're saying is that if you actually are using software which is measuring its emissions, then perhaps investing in making that software more efficient, you, that is enough evidence from a regulatory perspective. And, if you've got an open source project which has proven like emissions versus a a closed source equivalent, like you, there might eventually be a regulatory reason to start using the open source solution. Um, if you want to get involved, like what I call people who, what I call the community of people who are involved in Impact Framework, you know, developing manifest files, writing plugins, we're watchers, right? We take observations we compute environmental impacts. The reason why it's so powerful is you can observe your own software. You can observe your own software, but you can observe other people's software. If you can observe it, you can measure its impacts. If you can measure somebody else's carbon footprint, you can measure their carbon footprint. Okay, their carbon footprint. Join that dot together if you can. If you want to get involved, uh, there's a link there, um, IF What's Next, and there's basically a Google group that you can join where people are kind of chatting and, and if you want to get involved, and especially there. Um, I'm going to leave you with one thing, which is, you know, I'm not going to leave you with two things. Uh, so really the important take takeaway is that I've talked, I showed you a YAML file, I showed you this, I showed you that. Impact Framework is a technology that dilutes power. That's its intention. All it is, is a file format, right? It's a technology that dilutes, uh, dilutes power. So that's what it's intended for. Um, one last one, right? What's this? <laughs> it's a measure. You know it's a measure, right? <laughs> yeah, actually, it could be a start. It's actually a fathom. It's a distance between one fingertip and the other fingertip. But it perhaps is also the start of a clap. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.